Mission Engagement 101, and we're going to talk about five ways to engage in global mission. So we're going to start with Bible study and um, the mission yearbook um, uh, and uh, have a welcome and announcements. And when we get to the theme and presentation, I'm really glad that Doug Dix, uh, who is a PCUSA mission coworker serving in Israel and Palestine, who has actually been in Israel and Palestine for many years, I think, um, uh, is joining us and he's also gonna present so welcome, we're glad you're here. So our Bible study today is on- um, Before you get started on that, shall I end the polling? Yes, please. And let's see what, what came out on time. So we have Here I Am, Lord, by a significant margin, 74% of those who participated. And then a Great. cluster at around 44%, or take my life and let it be. And then, Lord, you have come to the lake shore. And a little bit below that, called as partners in Christ's service. All right. All right. Well, thank you everybody for taking part in that um, poll. And we will have a few more polls as the, um, as the session continues. Let's open with Bible study. And our scripture today is uh, chapter six, verses one through eight of the prophet Isaiah. Um, this is the, the story of his call. Let's listen for God's word to us today. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord, friends. So this is a scripture you've probably, many of us have heard before. Um, uh, Isaiah shares a vision of worship in heaven, which inspires both awe and dread. The vision is reported in the four movements of worship, Praise, confession, forgiveness and pardon, and response. This call story has been a point of reflection for many who ponder who God is and how God is calling. It has also served as the inspiration for many mission hymns, including the favorite of this group, or at least of many people in this group, Here I Am, Lord. And on the screen, um, there's, uh, if you look up Mark Chagall, Isaiah, um, you will see uh, many different pieces that Mark Chagall uh, painted over the years about Isaiah's vision. Today's mission yearbook entry shares an initiative of the Presbyterian Hunger Program partnering with local groups in Cameroon, a country in West Africa, 
on the central Atlantic coast of the continent, which is embroiled and has been embroiled for some time in conflict between its French speaking and English speaking regions, which are a legacy of mission and colonial history. You can see on the map, uh, the English speaking section and then the much larger French speaking section. And that it is the English speaking or Anglophone um, uh, sections of the country that are really under great oppression. The program uh, that is in the mission yearbook today that the mission yearbook celebrates and lifts up helps farmers, including this woman who received a pig through this initiative. Throughout the mission yearbook, you can find stories of Presbyterian bodies and offices partner, partnering with people and organizations on the ground who lead the work and to whom the PCUSA and its staff are accountable. This is a mark of who we are as Presbyterians in mission. The prayer from today's entry in the mission yearbook is on the screen, so let's pray together. God, we pray for the Anglophone farmers and a return of peace. Help our farmers to take care of the earth's resources, cherish them, and pass them on safely to the next generation. Bless all those who have contributed to our work and grant us perseverance and openness to your will. Amen. I'd invite the Reverend Jeff Schooley to speak, um, uh, representing the Global Mission Network of Scioto Valley Presbytery. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Cynthia, and welcome everyone. We remain so grateful for your participation, especially as the Saturdays get warmer and sunnier. I mean, this was a pretty easy thing to do in January when there wasn't much else going on, but you all are remaining committed to this. Uh, even when, I mean, the weather draws all of us into the outdoors. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Just have a, a couple of announcements before we begin. Today, we're going to hear a, a lot about five forms of engagement, uh, and that'll make more sense by the end of our time together. But I just wanted you to know that after today, you're going to receive by email a two-page document that Cynthia has put together that is just full of links to various parts of the PCUSA website. Um, and, and each of those links uh, correspond to those different forms of engagement. Uh, we all know the PCUSA website is big and sprawling and she has done a wonderful job curating and sort of condensing everything together. Um, also, uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, the members of the Global Mission Network are going to be contacting uh, at least one person from your church. So if you're the only person from your church showing up to these meetings, you'll be getting a phone call from one of us. If you're one of like five, well, then there's a, a one in five chance that you'll get called, but somebody from your church will be called. And this is really just to uh, check in, see what you've been learning, um, where you're feeling led out of this uh, engagement opportunities that we've been providing and, and trying to make the Global Mission Network uh, an available resource to you and your congregations as you go forward with uh, global mission engagement outside of you know, Saturday morning webinars once a month. And finally, I just wanted to share, we had a, we had a brief meeting, the Global Mission Network, uh, a couple of days ago in advance of this. And somewhere along the line, uh, we got to talking about the uh, Matthew 9 uh, parable or teaching Jesus gives about Lord of the Harvest. You know the one where uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I only note that because we were talking about that literally right after we had gotten done talking about how amazed we are that so many people have been participating across the presbytery in these events and uh i thought it was kind of funny to think of wow so many people are participating and then to be talking about the laborers are few but then it hit me why that makes sense because as more and more laborers come together as we learn to partner with our global mission 
uh, coworkers around the world. We, it's not that uh, we're not impressed by the number of people doing good work, but rather that we are impressed at just how great the harvest is. So sorry, I didn't preach last Sunday and I really needed to do a brief homily. Thank you for indulging that. Um, and those are the uh, announcements I have for us. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and uh, thank you for the members of the Global Mission Network who are part of that group of laborers. Cynthia? Are... Yes? I'm sorry, this is Les, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to tag on to Jeff's uh, announcement that members of the network would be calling uh, people. We do not have a complete listing of phone numbers. So if you could include a phone number you're willing to be reached at in the chat opposite your sign-in name, that would be most helpful in facilitating our contacts with you. Great. Are there other members of the uh, Global Mission Network who need to share a word? All right. Um, uh, so uh, this has been, for me, a really wonderful opportunity to get to know people in this network. And they are just a, a great, uh, goofy, um, uh, thoughtful, and funny uh, group of people and fun to be with. Um, so. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Today, uh, we are gonna talk about five ways to engage in global mission. Um, I'm gonna be talking about how to do that from a um, kind of uh, high level uh, way of how we could do that anywhere in the world. And then Doug Dix is uh, who serves um, our church and people in Israel and Palestine and has done so for a very long time. Um, is going to take those five ways and talk about what those mean on the ground in his ministry. So let's get started. Um, so this is um, an exciting moment for all of us who have been on this learning journey for the last four months. Uh, as we think about how to deepen our engagement in global mission, this is going to take prayer conversation and dreaming together. And it's a time to ask questions and you will see, I'm gonna to suggest to you a number of questions in this presentation and to discuss the future of our engagement with others. Um, and uh, Bob, I think we have a poll to see how we are engaging in global mission now. All right. So um, which of these ways in the past or in the present have you or your congregation engaged in global missions? So if you see that poll, please vote. And you can check all that apply. All right, Bob, I think that people have responded and it looks like relationships with people is, is a high vote getter. Worship and education, a lot of congregations are evidently doing that kind of engagement. The other three are not unknown to a number of folks, which is really good news. Thank you all. So, I wanted to share with you, you've probably seen the, the Venn diagram before. Um, uh, and these ways of engagement are not, they don't have strong firm borders. So, uh, so if you're doing one form, you might be also doing another one. So uh, it isn't like, you know, you, you can only do one at a time. You're generally doing more than one.
We're looking at five ways to engage in alphabetical order, so advocacy is first. The work of advocacy has been part of American Presbyterian identity since there were Presbyterians in what became the US. After World War II, Presbyterians were leading figures in work that led to the formation of the Office of Public, Public Witness, uh, which is housed in a building shared with many other faith-based organizations that is next door to the Supreme Court of the United States in Washington, DC and in ministry at the United Nations, which is housed in a building across the street from the UN. Over the centuries, Presbyterians have advocated for many things and worked to confront others. To, get, to engage in any way in global mission, you have to start with asking questions. And here are some of the questions that you could discuss to help you develop a faithful engagement through advocacy plan. So you have to think about who is our community? Who is our neighbor? Who are our neighbors, old and new? And what are people in our community thinking about? I put five options down there, but there might be others that people are thinking about. Uh, what issues in the world impact us and our neighbors and what are we called? to do and say about these issues. The Presbyterian Church offers us many resources to help us study, think about, discuss, and engage more deeply in global mission through advocacy. After today's session, as Jeff mentioned, a document with links to many of these will be sent to all registrants in this course. Some of the resources available to help us work in engaging uh, global missions through advocacy include adult study curriculum, which is free for download, directions on how to form advocacy teams, and information for which you can subscribe, register, or sign up to take part. I'm wondering if any of uh, our, our participants today have taken part in the UN Commission on the Status of Women because we have Presbyterian participation in that every year. It just happened um, a few weeks ago. So if you have ever participated as a Presbyterian uh, in the UN Commission on the Status of Women, it'd be great if you would let us know in the chat that how to do sustainable development uh, study was part of the pre-reading for this, um, uh, for this uh, session and um, I realized that they had also published uh, a downloadable leader's guide for that. So there's an extra resource that I'm going to be sending you. You can engage in global mission through an issue about which you sense a call to act. Ask questions, discuss with each other, pray and ask God for guidance. The Presbyterian Church has resources available and work about a plethora of issues, some of which are on the screen. A member of the Global Mission Network can help you and others with whom you are seeking to engage more deeply, whether those are in your own congregation or in other congregations with you, whom you see opportunities for collaboration. Offering ideas and helping you find resources about the issue or issues on which you feel called to focus your global mission efforts. Um, this was a big boat getter on that poll. Many congregations and individuals through the years have engaged in global mission with joy and love through relationships with people. To start again, ask questions. And like the lawyer who talked with Jesus in a story related in the 10th chapter of Luke, one of those questions has to be, who are our neighbors? Uh, that lawyer asked that, and, and then Jesus told a wonderful story of the Good Samaritan, um, which was a surprising uh, answer to that question uh, to the lawyer and undoubtedly to Jesus' other hearers. We might be surprised about who our neighbors are. The question can be answered literally, who lives in our neighborhood, but also figuratively and historically. The last question on this slide leads us to a wealth of resources of people who can help us discern 
a faithful engagement future. On the screen are some of those people who are ready to help us in increase our engagement in global mission. Chris Roseland has been taking part in this uh, series and, um, and is not with us today because his presbytery is meeting today. Uh, so uh, he, he let me know that um, when I said your, your wonderful face is going to be on the screen, he said, oh, no, I won't be there. But, uh, but he will be with us uh, next time. And he is actually uh, PCUSA staff uh, who is available to individuals and congregations seeking to deepen their relationships. So uh, this is a person you could reach out to. And on that page of resources, I will include his phone number and email if you're interested in working with uh, Chris to deepen your engagement. The Presbyterian Foundation can help you invest funds to produce support for mission. The first gift held by the, the oldest gift held by the foundation, which is still producing funds for God's mission was given in 1821, 200 years ago now, which I think is totally cool. Members of the Global Mission Network are available to individuals and congregations to help you think about your engagement. And in your neighborhood, when you think about who is my neighbor, there are neighbors old and new in most of our, our neighborhoods. Um, and there are some people whom you might not have considered before as resources for learning. Um, and, and this is true in all of our relations, uh, all of our neighborhoods, no matter where we live. You can choose a region of the world in which to focus your mission engagement. Many Presbyterians have done that, forming mission networks for regions in every corner of the globe. Um, those mission networks, and there's 14 of them, which is just a lot. Um, many of them are led by lay people. This is not something that uh, has come about because somebody in Louisville or somebody in a presbytery or synod office um, has decided, oh, we need this. Uh, this has come about, these 14 have come about and others are in formation uh, because uh, there are people, Presbyterians, faithful Presbyterians who um, uh, have a heart for a particular issue or region of the world, and they want they want to gather other people around that. Uh, so those mission networks, which all of them, um, uh, the page includes, uh, which I will I will give you the address. The page includes contact information for them and also information about their upcoming meetings. Many of which at present are online. Also, the UN Office of the Presbyterian Church uh, uh, publishes country fact sheets. And those mission co-workers, gosh, they are, uh, have a wealth of information to offer. So if there is a place in the world that you or your congregation is interested, gosh, we'd really like to focus on that region or country. Um, if you find out uh, that, and you can, you can, Find that through the PCUSA website that we have staff who are working there. Um, they are very much a source of great on the ground information of what is going on in that place. And of course, those neighbors old and new are also resources for us. I wanted to just give a shout out to Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. Uh, PDA is a well-known and respected actor in disaster relief across the world. They respond to national and international disasters and they offer a lot of information and learning and, and training for individuals and congregations with a heart for engagement in relief, assistance and work to help people recover both short and long-term. Um, after the hurricane, and I'm, I'm blanking on it, but the hurricane that hit New Orleans um, 10 or 12 years ago, PDA stayed in New Orleans and Louisiana and the Gulf Coast um, for years uh, because they are interested not only uh, for us, for the Presbyterian Church, they're interested not only 
in staying for the, the, the moment that it's all over the news, but for the long term to get people back on their feet. So PDA would be a place where you could find resources and engage. You and your congregation can plan for mission engagement through the year, through your worship and education ministries. And it was clear from the poll, a lot of people are already doing this. Like in other forms of engagement, start with questions. Some ideas for these are on the screen. Cynthia, if yes. I might interrupt just a minute. Yes. Yes. We do have participating with us today, Ellen Sherby from our national staff, a colleague of, uh, I'm sorry. Chris my, Roseland. Chris Roseland. And mm -hmm. she is a key resource person for uh, mission engagement uh, that you'll want to know about. And I think her contact information is in the chat or you'll be providing it to people later. But welcome to Ellen. Who We're also glad helped, Ellen is with also us. Helped Ellen us launch the initial global network in this presbytery. And Ellen also uh, took part in authoring the, the um, uh, global mission guide uh, the web guide that we have been using throughout the study. So Thank we're you. glad Ellen is with us. Um, so if you want to engage through your worship and education ministries, um, uh, there are a number of ideas here to get you started. And I know if you choose this form of engagement, uh, gathered Presbyterians will come up with lots of, of lots more creative ideas and lots more questions to, uh, to use to engage in this way. The Presbyterian Church has four church-wide special offerings, which fall nicely into the four seasons of the year. And if you wanna make mission engagement a focus of your worship and education ministries, you could increase the number of moments by doing summer education, giving part on Giving Tuesday, which is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, or creating a year-end giving campaign around global mission. And um, Bob, I think we've got a poll on the special offerings. So would you let us know which of these your congregation takes part in and check all that apply? Just so everybody knows, the poll does disappear after you voted. So don't be frantic if you vote and it disappears. All right, it looks like um, one great hour of sharing, no surprise. One great hour of sharing is um, uh, the big vote getter here, but many congregations are also taking the Christmas joy offering and over 60%, nearly 70% are taking peace and global witness and Pentecost. Thank you, everybody. There are many resources available on the PCUSA website for ordering through the Thoughtful Christian. Um, uh, you can, uh, the thoughtfulchristian.com and that, that um, uh, link is gonna be on the document I send you, but the thoughtfulchristian.com produces uh, studies uh, one week, one session, six sessions uh, for children, youth and adults that are downloadable studies. But there's a lot of things also just on the PCUSA website that's available uh, for the cost of downloading. And I wanted to give a shout out to Presbyterian women. Uh, Presbyterian women have been engaged in supporting and in fact initiating mission uh, for centuries. Um, uh, so PW on their website um, has lots and lots of different resources that, um, that uh, about global mission and um, 
when the pandemic makes it possible, I know that they will be taking Presbyterians across the globe to, uh, to encounter and learn again. All right, um, that is the end of my part of the um, presentation. And so I am uh, grateful um, uh, for the opportunity to share with you, but I'm also grateful that um, Doug Dix is here. Uh, and Doug uh, is a mission coworker of the PCUSA who serves in Israel and Palestine. And he is going to uh, share uh, about his ministry uh, and I think uh, he's going to share how those five ways of engagement uh, are lived out in his ministry and other folks' ministries of the Presbyterian Church in Israel and Palestine. Welcome, Doug. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. And sorry that I had to switch uh, early on, but uh, the sound left my laptop. So I've joined you from my uh, iPad, which seems to be working fine. <laughs> Um, I've been a mission co-worker with the Presbyterian Church for, I think this is the 22nd year now, um, serving in Israel, Palestine, and I also served for um, six and a half years in Jordan. So, and my role has been largely um, educational. It has been uh, to host and to escort and to accompany um, visiting tour groups, um, to get down the bus and to meet with Palestinians particularly Palestinian Christians, um, and rather than uh, going to Masada on a Sunday morning to worship with a local Arab-speaking congregation in Jerusalem or Bethlehem or Nazareth or wherever, wherever we happen to be. So my role is really one of, of accompaniment and um, uh, working alongside of our partners that are based here, our church-based partners, which are uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church um, in Jordan and the Holy Land, and also the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem, which expands over five countries. Um, it's also a ministry of presence, to be physically present here on the ground, um, particularly now during this pandemic, when, when many people have left and when we're not seeing um, any tourists or visitors to speak of. Um, and also uh, that presence provides a sense of hope um, to our partners and to our um, friends here on the ground um, that we didn't leave, that we stayed, that we stand in solidarity with you, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes my work involves sitting around a table and exchanging ideas with people. Um, how can we discern best how to tackle or address relevant concerns? whether it's issues of water, whether it's issues of land use, land resources, um, whether it is uh, issues related to the occupation and families that are um, subjected to either losing their lands or having their homes demolished. So um, in one-on-one -on -one conversations with our, with our mission partners, with the local, with the local community. Um, you've already mentioned, Cynthia, but I'll mention again, is assisting our partner organizations by helping them to apply or making them aware of um, some of the grants or financial assistance that are available through our denomination, such as um, the offerings that you mentioned, the One Great Hiring and um, um, grants through Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. And um, some years ago, when our denomination Voted um, to divest from three different companies that were profiting from the occupation, um, Caterpillar, Motorola, and Hewlett Packard. Um, we passed at one of our assemblies the, the idea that rather than just divest, that we should positively, positively invest in the region. And so through the Presbyterian Foundation, they have provided um, uh, a certain percentage of their budget that we use to, posit to positively invest in the region. Um, that usually consists of small loans at a very low interest rate, usually two or 3%. Um, organizations have to pay back, but that's our way of investing um, in the region. Um, now that we're engaged in Zoom, um, we're going to have our, one of our first webinars coming up on April the 27th. 
um, on Palestine. So webinars are another way to help educate our denomination concerning um, issues of Israel and Palestine. Um, and the come and see visits, um, we did a, a film in early December um, called Come and See, and um, uh, it's still up on the web. If you haven't seen it, you can you can see that. Um, and then we, the travel study seminars. Every two years, we do a um, a, um, uh, a mosaic of peace uh, travel study seminar, where we actually bring people, and people come and meet with some of our partners, engage in some of the issues. Uh, they visit the holy sites, uh, etc. Um, that any other um, group that might be visiting um, would want to. Um, we also assist um, with a local partner organization. In other words, I don't exist here in a bubble. So my sponsoring church is St. Andrews, the Church of Scotland. So I assist in and participate in the life and the liturgy of the church um, in Jerusalem whether that's leading prayers, whether that's playing the piano on Sunday when the pianist doesn't show up, uh, whether that's greeting people at the front door, et cetera, et cetera. And then serving um, as part of, the, as part of the, um, the, the Presbytery of Jerusalem for that church. Um, and then of course, we encourage people to advocate for a, a, a peace based on justice and fairness of the region and any ways that people can do that. And one of them is by joining um, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA, um, which um, is a very vibrant uh, organization and is made up of very dedicated people. You can become a member of them and they have a website. Um, and you can, if you need that, you can um, either write to me or I'll send it to Cynthia and she can give it to you. Um, support one of our partner organizations through an extra commitment opportunity account not all of our partner organizations have uh, accounts, but many of them do, and many of them are online. Um, and you can donate to um, that, uh, to one of those organizations. You can support a mission worker in the region, such as myself. And you can also sign up to read my um, quarterly newsletters, which also appear on the, on the web. And you can either read them on the web or you can subscribe to getting them mailed directly to you um, where you are. Um, you can also um, engage by um, looking into what resources our denomination has already put out there. Um, in 1997, I think it was, we had a, a booklet called Resolution on the Middle East that's still relevant. I think it probably could be updated, but it's a very good, uh, good document and it's well-grounded. And then the, um, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA has created at least four resources, um, booklets. The first one was The Cradle of Our Faith. The second one was Stead Hope. The third one was Zionism Unsettled. And the fourth one was Why Palestine Matters, The Struggle to End Colonialism. Um, so you can become familiar with those. You can get copies of those. You can um, sponsor a study group to study one of those documents. Um, and you can become familiar with what our church has said over various general assemblies um, related to Israel and Palestine, which are usually issues that are very passionate, sometimes very heated, but um, uh, becoming familiar with um, uh, the resolutions that have been passed by our assembly. And you can also become familiar with what the local churches here are saying about their situation, situation on the ground. Um, and then there is the organization Kairos Palestine, um, which issues usually an Easter alert and a Christmas alert every year. Um, and Kairos Palestine was founded about 11 years ago um, as a cry from the heart of the Palestinian people, um, not only to the Israeli people, but to the world and to churches and to anyone who happens to be listening. Um, we also engage in um, Israeli human rights organizations such as Beit Selim, which is the premier Israeli human rights organization. Um, and they recently came out in January with a statement where they are uh, calling what Israel is currently engaged in on the ground as apartheid. And they've listed four reasons for that. Um, and it has to do with the, how Israel engineers space um, to accommodate one group of people at the expense of another, 
but then they listed not only the issues of land, but also citizenship, freedom of movement, and political participation. Um, we also provide um, every year um, the names of, of potential speakers who could be um, international peacemakers. Um, and um, uh, we, have had, we have had participants in that program. And another way you can do it is um, advocate and engage in mission is to um, include bulletin inserts about issues or about mission workers or about some of, the, some of our partner churches and include those in your local churches bulletins. And finally, I don't want to, um, I don't want to um, downplay the issue of writing to your Senator and Congressperson. And you can, you can do that through the Presbyterian Washington office. Um, they're, they're very um, active on issues related to what um, Congress is doing on Capitol Hill. I, I'm, I myself uh, belong to that and I get their alerts from the Presbyterian Washington office. And also um, probably the last, but not the least way would be to find out how you can become a, a commissioner to one of our general assemblies so that you actually get a vote and a voice on the floor and you will serve on a committee um, that is engaged in making um, the decisions that our church is engaged in. So I think that's it, you questions, but um, yeah, these are my ideas. Uh, I have a question um, for you. Uh, Doug, and thank you for that. Um, and I would say to uh, Bob Armstrong, um, we have a poll that we're going to put up here in a minute. But Doug, um, can you share a little bit more about the particular ministry that you're doing there uh, in Israel and Palestine? What's the role that you are playing there? Well, uh, that's changed <laughs> since COVID-19. Um, pr my primary role is again, um, is working with uh, people, uh, organizations, churches, presbyteries, whatever, that may be considering a visit to the region. For example, right now I'm engaging um, um, with uh, Fourth Presbyterian in Chicago, which wants to bring a choir and an inter um, a group next year, next June um, to the Holy Land and looking at their itinerary and finding out how we can get them to be more engaged on the ground with introducing them to some of our partner organizations um, and how they can help them as they're traveling in and about the country. But my ministry now is largely um, because our churches have been closed. So we were doing Zoom worship like many of you were. Um, and as an ecumenical associate for the Church of Scotland, I was taking uh, my Sunday or my turn to actually put together a, a, a worship service via Zoom for about four minutes on a Sunday morning. Um, as of Easter Sunday, our two churches, St. Andrew's Jerusalem, St. Andrew's Tiberius, have reopened. Um, and so it's participating in worship there. For example, tomorrow I'm playing the piano because uh, our pianist cannot be there. Um, it's usually leading morning prayers. Um, and when I'm not at St. Andrews, I usually try to attend um, the service at the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer in the old city of Jerusalem and assist the pastor there in whatever I can because I serve on the, um, the, the church council for that uh, congregation, which is basically the English speaking congregation. We have an Arabic speaking congregation. We have a Danish speaking congregation. German speaking congregation, but I attend worship with the English speaking congregation and serve on their church council there. So, and it's also just letting, letting people know that, um, that, uh, that I am still here, that the Presbyterian church is still here, is still engaged, still wants to hear what your issues, what your concerns are from our partner organizations. Um, but again, um, we've been restricted to, um, uh, to not having in-person meetings so because of the virus. So um, yeah, it's just letting people know that we're still here and we still want to engage and we haven't forgotten you. Thanks, Doug. Um, I would say, Bob, why don't we put that poll up? And um, the poll is having heard um, something about five different ways to engage. Um, 
you now have an opportunity to share um, what you might like to explore. And that might be different or the same as what you've already done. Uh, so we're gonna do that for a minute and see where people are thinking. So we have a few more people, but I, I know some of our attendees like me are not, are not voting. Um, so, um, uh, so we may be closing in on the end. Um, and it's interesting to me to see, um, uh, Bob, if you can share, uh, issues came out at 56%, but we're above or around 40 to 60% for all five ways. So that's interesting. Um, I would then turn to Pastor Jeff Schooley, uh, who's gonna moderate our time of question and answer. Great, thank you, Cynthia. And as we've done every month, uh, please share your questions in the chat and I will relay those to Doug. Um, but I have one to kind of get us started uh, Doug, as Cynthia noted, um, all of these forms of engagement are in a Venn diagram. They all overlap with one another. But I also know that, you know, um, we're not perfect and probably all of the circles in that Venn diagram aren't of the same size. And so in your opinion, which form of engagement isn't getting enough attention from PCUSA congregations right now? And then what's a way to start getting a foothold for increasing this form of engagement? I didn't see the diagram, but I have an idea. I mean, I know what you're talking about. Is there any way you can put that back up? Oh, I, it's, a, it's more of a conceptual thing. The, all five oh, okay. forms overlap. Of the, of the five that, that consisted of the five questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or of the five options, I mean? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I would say probably relationships with people maybe one that's lacking now because, um, you know, people are feeling cut off, people are feeling, um, um, especially because of the COVID-19, you know, people are forgotten. And um, maybe that's one of the ways that we need to work on in terms of, um, I mean, and I'm talking about as a, as a denomination, um, uh, to let people know that, um, that we are still here, we're still concerned, um, many of your issues are our issues, many of your pain are our pains, uh, et cetera. Yeah, so I would say probably the relationships with people. We don't want to let that slip. Good, good. Um, this is a, a question that's kind of come up each month in some form or another, and maybe that's a reflection of my own subtext. And again, folks, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Uh, but advocacy is always running real close to politics and obviously churches that have fragmented over other issues, sometimes ecclesial issues in the past, are real allergic to anything that can create even the possibility of additional discord. Do you have any guidance, uh, sort of even pastoral guidance for how to how to take on advocacy as an aspect of Christian discipleship and not in a partisan manner? Mm. Well, I think, um, yes, I mean, that, that's, that's, it's, it's certainly a divisive issue. Um, and um, I have always advised people to um, keep their, um, their issues grounded in human rights, because if it, if it, if it steps on or if it, um, if it, um, if it dis discriminates against the human rights of, of one group of people over another, then I think that's nothing that, that anyone can argue with. 
um, number one. Number two, for me personally, I think it was, uh, was political. Uh, he challenged the political and religious leadership of his day, and I think that we need to be doing it. Good. Thank you. Um, one of our Global Mission Network members, uh, and really the godfather of the GMN, uh, Les Sauer, <laughs> asked, what is the state of Christian exodus from Palestine? Yeah. Um, it's not... Uh, it's not at the moment, but certainly the numbers are down, um, particularly in Gaza. I remember the figure we used to quote was about 2,500 Christians in Gaza, and now I think the number is hovering around 1,000 or less. Um, in the West Bank, it's probably, in Israel, about 150,000. In the West Bank, about another 50,000. Um, but, you know, I think this is true of any, any situation in the world where you have uh, political unrest, um, where the young, the young people feel there is no hope for their future. Um, I think this is a trend that's going to continue among, among Christians, uh, particularly because they're the ones that have the relationships with the West. Uh, many of them go abroad to study for higher education and choose not to return. Um, and it has to do with the, with the issues here on the ground, which is a lack of movement. For example, I'm living in Bethlehem, but I, I carry an American passport and I can pass through the checkpoint, which is about a mile from here or less, uh, to go to Jerusalem, which is only six miles away. And yet there are many people living here in Bethlehem who haven't been to Jerusalem in years. Uh, and again, it's only six miles away. So the lack of, the lack of freedom of movement, uh, the lack of any, any movement in the direction of a political settlement related to the issue of, of Israel, Palestine, an independent state, one state, uh, two states. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue, I think, to have uh, ramifications for, for those that can, can go and can emigrate, so. Jeff, I wanted to jump in on this too. Um, uh, I uh, was struck by your question, Jeff, about uh, partisanship. And I think in the church, we would like things not to be partisan. Um, we would like to have everybody like each other. Um, yeah. Like someone said at some point, can't we all just get along? Um, and, and I agreed with uh, your statement that Jesus was not uh, apolitical, but the fact is God is partisan. We serve a partisan God. Uh, we serve a God who comes in on the side of the poor and the oppressed pretty um, invariably through scripture. So it is um, uh, particularly if we have a comfortable life, if we are among the people in the, in the world who have a comfortable life, it's discomforting. It's, it's uncomfortable to realize that our, we serve a God, we worship a God who um, uh, is a partisan, is a partisan, a political partisan for poor and oppressed people. Um, uh, so it makes it difficult. I would also say that the scripture that we started with, it's not, it's not an accident or a casual comment that Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died. Um, uh, because, um, uh, because that means the nation is in a time of transition. And um, any time that a, a, a leader dies in office, um, a transition can be very difficult. Um, uh, and so it, throughout the Bible, um, push your preachers, friends, mm -hmm. push your preachers to identify where the scripture writers are making a point of noting political realities. Um, uh, and, and it's when that transition was going on in a country which sparked all kinds of uncertainty and fear that Isaiah had this vision. I think um, uh, Jeff, Bob Armstrong may have something that he wants to say on this issue. Thank you, Cynthia. One of the challenges I think we have is that we have difficulty reading the early New Testament 
in light of what it was like back then. Um, for one thing, when we think about Jesus saying to the disciples, a new commandment I give you, you love one another. And by this shall all know that you're my disciples. We forget how disparate that group was to start with. We think of them as being a bunch of Jewish guys, which is true. But you have Simon and Andrew, James and John, the Zebedee boys, who are sons of middle-class business people who have enough ship, uh, fishing boats and servants that they can keep the business going while the boys are chasing after Jesus. Sitting next to them, you have Matthew, the tax collector, who made a living by extorting money out of Simon and Andrew, James and John's daddies with Roman spears. And sitting next to him, you have Simon the Zealot, who is actually a terrorist who would actually slit the throats of people like Matthew and uh, write all sorts of graffiti all over the walls of Simon and Andrew, James and John's daddies, because they were colluding with the Romans to keep their business going. And so when Jesus says, if you guys love one another, everyone's going to know the only possible reason why you would be together would be because you're my disciples, not because there's any political or social unification. They don't have anything in common other than where they happen to reside. Um, Paul's letter to the Philippians, we translate some really oddly. We say, um, so live a life worthy of the gospel and miss out that the word underlying that is polituis that, which is actually a Greek word for being able to participate in a city-state conversation where you work out the differences between us. And central to Jesus' way is community discernment. We don't know what it is that God wants because there's such a division. If you jump to Acts chapter 6, the church is growing, and so it absorbs the cultural problems of Greek-speaking and Hebrew-speaking widows and orphans and the unconscious inherent uh, prejudices come out and that there's not an equal distribution of the food. So when the church works out how to actually resolve that, it becomes a witness to the community at large. I think the biggest challenge we have is that we have missed that the mission of God is about forming community that can have the hard conversations because we're not trying to say what's the Republican stance or the Democratic stance, but actually what's Christ, Lord of the world, calling us to do and be. Well, and if, and if I may just add, that is when we achieve the sort of community Bob is describing, that is an extremely interesting witness to the world. And I know this because the Avengers film series, back when we went to actual movie theaters, was wildly popular. And what made it so popular, at least in part, was just how different each of the Avengers are, especially Captain America and Iron Man, right? And so every fan of that franchise knows, oh, these guys are very different. And yet they find a form of unity with one another that drives global sales up into the billions because people want to see that sort of story. And uh, yeah, the church could have been and should have been that sort of story every single week uh, as they gathered for worship. I'm hoping, I just saw a chat come up. Uh, oh no, that's just an amen to Bob. Thank you for that, Jim. Uh, I'm gonna keep trying to pitch questions to Doug, but I'd love to pitch your questions. Um, Doug, uh, I'm sure this isn't the first time you've got to address a group of Presbyterians, and I'm sure sometimes folks reach out to you. Um, what's the question you wish people reached out to you and asked more often? Oh, that's a good one. I thought about that. Hmm. Gosh. Maybe uh, why I have kept at this as long as I have. Because uh, in 1995, I was coming to, uh, to Israel and Palestine for two years. 
and I wanted to get uh, Israel-Palestine thing out of my system. Um, and it's still very much in my system. So maybe the question should be, why have I stayed? <laughs> and, and why have you stayed then? Uh, because I still believe in the work that I'm doing, and I still believe in the in the in the opportunity that the Presbyterian Church has provided me with to be here. Uh, and I still think that every day is a new day to educate another person, uh, to open their eyes, to open their hearts, um, and to again maybe make them feel unsettled about what what we thought was happening in this part of. I think that, that many of our churches have been responsible over the years, many of our denominations, I should say, not just the Presbyterians, um, in terms of um, uh, bringing groups to the Holy Land to just visit archaeological sites. And we ignored the people. We ignored the, the Christian presence here. And it wasn't until very late in the game um, did we realize that the forgotten faithful, as they're called, uh, the Palestinian Arab Christians uh, um, uh, have been here, uh, are here, um, deserve our support, deserve our love. Um, and how can we help uh, engage with them? Because it is the churches that run the, the best schools here um, in the region. And also um, uh, they run social service institutions where their, um, their employees basically practice a a, a pattern of service called witness through service, um, because the because the reality is the the predominant um, religion even in the Palestinian territories is Islam. So uh, in the hospitals that they run, in the clinics, in the social service institutions, in the homes for the physically uh, and mentally disabled, um, it is a way for them to to let their lives demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, to a, a population that is largely not Christian. Thank you for that. Let me go ahead and then uh, switch it around, maybe more towards the uh, pessimistic way. What is the question that you get asked most often that you're just tired of answering? <laughs> oh, let's see. Gosh, maybe it hasn't. Maybe nobody has asked it yet. I, I don't get tired of. I don't get tired. I don't think of, of answering any questions. So I, I can't say the question that I'm answering. I'm always, if I don't know the answer, I try to find it for someone. So um, yeah, I, I can't say that there is one. Well, that, I guess that, that, that makes sense uh, since you've got this Israel-Palestine issue in your bones still that you tried to get rid of however many years ago and just couldn't. I, I would have assumed that it would have but it would have been people bringing certain theological misreadings of the role of Israel in the eschaton. Um, and, and sort of, because folks who tend to bring that sort of question, bring that with, I mean, full eschatological hope, and that really raises the stakes. Is that something that you encounter frequently, or is that a sort of question that's fallen out of vogue? Well, certainly not for the last year or so because of the pandemic, because we haven't had any visitors. But yes, occasionally people do come. And, um, you know, usually when, when I travel, I, li I like to think that, that my mind and my, my, my curiosity is open to learn, you know, the, the, old, the old adage, when in Rome. Um, and so that's my hope is that, that people can, when they travel, they can come um, and ditch some of the things that they, they thought they knew about this place or that they knew uh, concerning um, theological issues and listen and learn. Um, and I think it's a very rich place um, to listen to people. And I also think that the land speaks, you know, there, there's the notion that the land is the fifth gospel. And I think that's true uh, in, in many ways. And so, um, yeah, just always being open to something new and being open to learn and uh, not be too couched in, uh, in what we think we know. Very good. I, I got a question from Otto Zeng. And Otto, I was starting to get worried. I'm glad to see you comment. I've been banking on your participation month after month. Uh, Otto asks, what books do you recommend for understanding the uh, Israel-Palestine dilemma and possible ways forward? Mm. How about if I send that to Cynthia? 
Um, yeah. Because we're, we're because we we do have a list and we're constantly updating best. Uh, yeah, uh, and as as things get outdated, then um, there are new there are new and insightful resources that we use. So, yeah, may I send that to Cynthia? Yeah, that'll be something I'm sure she'll be able to pass along to the entire uh, uh, participants group of participants here. Um, Les Sauer, again, as the godfather of the Global Mission Network and the Presbytery, wants to bring me down from the 10,000 foot view, uh, which is what he's great at, and asks, when a congregation <laughs> slash individual wants to support your work, what is the mechanism for that? How do they put that into effect? And are they already supporting you and other PCUSA mission coworkers through the congregation's mission giving? I think it's done through mission through the Office of Mission Engagement, which would be Chris Roseland and or um, my direct contact is Nicole Gherkins. Um, but uh, I think all of our mission partners have a a web page, unless they're unless they're working in a very sensitive part of the world where that's not allowed. But if you just Google Douglas Dix, you'll come up with uh, my my homepage on the Presbyterian Church site. My newsletters are there, and then there may be a way that uh, it, it points someone in the direction of, um, of how you can support uh, me or another mission worker. Very good. Um, I think we only have a few more minutes here, so I'll just hit you with like the, the, the big question and the, you know, the, uh, the, the elephant in the room, has the Peace USA taken sides in Israel and Palestine? Mm. Well, I think, I think primarily our, 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 our main concern is the dwindling Christian community. So in that regard, perhaps yes, um, they have taken sides. Um, um, but you have to remember that in Israel, um, it's very difficult to engage um, anyone about the gospel of Jesus Christ without being accused of uh, proselytizing, which is illegal in Israel, by the way. Um, so in a part of the world where it's difficult to speak about the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, we, um, we engage with um, the side that First of all, we're concerned about because of the dwindling numbers. And second of all, I think we're concerned about because of the, of the human rights issues. Um, and I think we also work very diligently at, at, at a retelling of the, of, the, um, of the events of 1948, um, where Israel says it was their independence, Palestinians claim it was their Nakba, the catastrophe. Where, where 400 villages were destroyed, 750,000 people were made refugees, um, and 70 some years later, those people have neither been allowed to return, many of which do not exist, but some do. Uh, but many of the villages were destroyed, nor have they been compensated for them. So all of the, the issues that the United, United Nations has been engaged in and the resolutions they've come up with, 242, 338, 425, all related to land for peace, um, have largely gone ignored. So I think we have taken sides. I, I think we have, but I, I, I would hope, it's my hope that it would be for the greater good of both peoples, not just one. Yeah, no, that, that sounds good. It, it's, it's um, partisan, not in the uh, way in which American politics defines partisan, but partisan in the way that Cynthia earlier was defining partisan. Um, and it's a God who has hopes for all God's people. Yeah, um, exactly. Steve Hills from Boulevard asks, is hope waning for the two-state solution? Um. In my opinion, yes. I think that uh, Israel's, uh, the creation of facts on the ground, be it Israeli settlements, be it a tunnel and bridge system, which is connecting the settlements to Israel proper, um, uh, is creating a situation where uh, it's, it's all but impossible to, to divide this land. Um, and I think there are many Palestinians that would say, Call it what you want. Just give us the freedom to travel. Give us the freedom to move. Give us equal rights under the law. 
um, etc. Now, of course, Israel is much is very much against that because then it means the end of the Jewish state, um, and and the whole notion of of the creation of of Israel was a Jewish state for the Jewish people. Um, twenty percent, or at least twenty percent, of the population of Israel proper, uh, of whom are non-Jews, they're they're Arabs, they're other ethnic groups, so but but largely Arabs. So uh, for me personally, yes, I think it's it's all. I think the window of opportunity has closed. Um, I don't think Israel wants to divide the land. Um, and I don't see where that division can possibly occur. It, 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 it's very difficult. Yeah. So if, if I was a Palestinian, I would say, you know, forget the two state solution. I want to be, give me equal rights. See, you know, one voice, one vote. Give me the, the right to travel out of Ben Gurdian Airport and not have to travel to, to Jordan uh, to travel through the airport there, which is much more expensive. So yes, I, I, my personal feeling is yes. And I don't think that the Presbyterian church should be advocating for a two-state solution if our friends and partners here on the ground have also, um, have also uh, sensed that that, that that window of opportunity has closed. It, it seems to me that the, the two-state solution, and I am going to confess much more ignorance than knowledge here, but was an attempt, an, a top-down attempt to foster justice, which has a lot of virtue to it. Yeah. But it sounds like maybe now the pursuit of justice is going to be more bottom-up grassroots, starting with some of those individual human rights that you have been mentioning. Is that a, is that a fair way to start reframing it for Christians who want to think thoughtfully about this? I, I think so. I think so. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'll draw everyone's attention in the chat. Ellen Sherby gave a link to Doug Dix's Mission Connection page. And so maybe uh, click on that and bookmark it uh, quickly so you can return to it after our time together. I, I see that it's 1146. I, I have a couple more questions or at least one more that folks have asked, but I don't want to run us long. Bob, Cynthia, how are we doing time-wise? We're doing okay. I, I see one more uh, question and I know um, in the last five minutes, Jeff, you're gonna lead us in a closing prayer. Yeah. Um, including a prayer for Doug and his um, ministry um, uh, and for all of the congregations that are taking part here and, and their engagement. But um, I, I just see one more question there. So I think that we could address that too, Doug. Sure, sure. Um, oh, and look at that. Jenny threw a second one up there. But let's, let's Doug, see how quickly you can move. Otto <laughs> uh, and Elaine Zeng ask, are you familiar with the Wrestling Jerusalem drama? And is it a good discussion starter? Um, I'm not familiar with it, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, then I think uh, Otto would tell you that's something you should check out soon. Uh, <laughs> gonna write <a> it. <laughs> uh, one of our one of our own GMN members, Ginny Teet, asks: It is my experience that the eyes of most people are not open to the geopolitical realities that the poor and oppressed are experiencing, especially in Palestine. Can you speak to that? Um, I think that's probably true, and I think that's why we, why when uh, we put together groups or, or tour groups, or when people begin thinking about coming, um, you know, we know that coming to Israel and to Palestine to see the Holy Land, they want to see the holy sites, they want to see where Jesus walked, for example. But um, my work beyond that, uh, because it's not about where Jesus walked, but it's about how Jesus walked or how Jesus would walk today and where you would find Jesus in this place today. Um, so yes, and the Israeli tour system is not interested in that. That does not generate dollars. Taking people to Masada or to Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea uh, generates dollars. So um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that, is a, that is a big concern. Uh, I, think, I think Jenny's right, I think the largest the largest part of the of the of, of tourists that come to the Holy Land do not experience this, do not witness this. The only Palestinian they may meet would be a either a tour guide or a bus driver happens to be Palestinian. Um, the groups that come to Bethlehem spend a few hours here 
in a queue waiting to get in line to the Church of the Nativity. They may have a meal here, shop at an expensive uh, souvenir shop. Um, and the, the commission for the uh, tour guide will be sent back across the checkpoint to an Israeli guide who was forbidden to come into Bethlehem because Israel says it's unsafe for him. Uh, and he will walk away with the, the a, a 20, 30 percent commission uh, from what the, the group bought. So, yeah, I think that's true. The majority of people are, are not um, they're not engaged in in ethical or I mean, they, they come to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. But what Jesus represented, what Jesus said, what Jesus would do, would have done um, becomes irrelevant. It's all it all goes the window. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. I want, I, now. I want to say uh, a big thank you to Doug. Um, uh, we were supposed to have Doug and one of his colleagues, Victor Macari, uh, with us. And Victor um, uh, had a pretty severe stroke on Christmas Day. So we need to hold Victor and his uh, wife, Sarah, in our prayers. He continues to recover in the U.S. Um, yes. Uh, and so Doug uh, took the whole uh, uh, task of interpreting today, and I'm very grateful um, uh, for his time. And uh, you can either uh, turn on your, turn off your mute or turn yourself on and give him a round of applause or share a note in the chat to say thank you to Doug for his time. Um, through this session and through these, this series, I've just been really impressed and continuingly impressed with the commitment of our mission coworkers and, and how ready they are uh, to share knowledge that it's hard for us to get. Um, uh, I was thinking as you were speaking, Doug, about what we see on the news in the US, um, uh, what, we, um, uh, what we hear on the radio um, uh, about Israel and about Palestine. Um, and you have brought us a different word. Um, so uh, we're very, very grateful. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for having me. Um, you, are, you are welcome. And, and anytime you want to come to Sayota Valley Presbytery, I bet we can find places you can speak. Um, I would say um, to you all, you're going to get um, an email and probably a couple emails um, uh, depending on when I get the, the book list from uh, Doug, but I, I will send out today um, a, a list of web links for many of the things that we talked about today. Um, uh, and then when I get the book list, I will send that out to you too. Uh, and I wanna remind you that somebody from the Global Mission Network will be uh, connecting with uh, every congregation. And we have over 20 congregations that have taken part in at least part of this um, series uh, for which we're actually, our hearts are full. Um, we're, we're really pleased with how many uh, folks have taken part in this way. So, um, uh, so you will be getting a call um, uh, over the next couple of weeks um, to see uh, how you're thinking about engaging and we're encouraging congregation groups. If there's more than one of you in your congregation who've been taking part in this series, we encourage you to meet sometime in the next couple of weeks and start thinking about if you if you wanted to deepen your engagement, what would be what would be the outlines of that plan? How would you make that happen? What would be the steps that you'd have to take to to move in that direction? Also, we very much encourage. We have a number of folks who've taken part in the series who are. Um, one person, one brave person from a congregation in the Presbytery. Um, we encourage you to look over the list um, uh, that Les Sauer has shared and see if there might be another church in your area with whom you could collaborate or at least another friend with whom you could have a conversation about how do we do this? How do we get people to think about the world and our stance as Presbyterians in global mission? Uh, so, um, Doug, I hope you are seeing in the chat, there's a whole bunch of, uh,
words of thanks that are coming your way um, that are um, uh, reiterating and saying more than, than I had to say. Um, so we're so very- I did, I, I did see them and may I just take the time to say hello to colleagues and friends, Jenny and uh, Les Sauer and Alan Sherby. And there may be others on there, but my screen is quite small. So thank you for having me. <laughs> All right, and someone says you're halfway through your career serving there. Um, uh, so that means you have 20, 20 years to go. At 22 years, I hope I'm a little bit <laughs> further along than halfway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you, Doug. Uh, thank you to all of you who have taken part. And I think, Jeff, we are just about at the time of closing prayer. All right, let us go ahead and join together in prayer. Good and holy God, as we reflect on the five forms of engagement, we give you thanks and praise that when you tell us to love your neighbor and even love thy enemy, that you also make possible so many different forms this love can take. And if we have at least five forms of love for each other, we can scarcely count the number of ways that you love us. And yet here in this Eastertide, do not let us grow weary of giving you thanks and praise for the form of engagement that came through cross and empty tomb. You have turned our pitying cries of Hosanna into joyous hallelujahs. Mm. And so inspired by your hallelujah blessing over the entire world, we join you in engaging the world. We especially lift up all those mission co-workers who have, loving, who have lovingly joined us these many months and lift up now, especially Doug Dix and his partnership with you in Israel, Palestine. Lord, just as your good news started as you rose from a grave, so too do we pray that your work through Doug also begins from the ground up. It is only people who find their lives walking out of a grave who would risk pursuing your justice and your love in this manner. And so, Lord, make us ever the more these sorts of people. Tend also to Victor in his ongoing healing and support his wife, Sarah, in this time. And Lord, we, we pray for Mark and Cynthia as they return soon and very soon to the ministry you've called them in Tanzania. Bless them with safety in their travels and with faithfulness in the work they do there. And bless us all, dear Lord, as we depart today and look forward to gathering again next month. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.